to uh, make mention this morning that the beautiful flowers that are here at the foot of the cross are uh, in memory of a lady who uh, was at this church for many years, Jean Barnett. Some of you remember Jean, and she went home to be with the Lord this week at, in her 95th year, and uh, we had a service for her on Friday. And so uh, we just wanted to uh, put those flowers there in remembrance of her wonderful dear lady she went to bible school at ontario bible college and was here for many many years and when the staff at her home nursing home found out that she had passed away they said oh we know her she is the lady with the bible wouldn't that be an amazing thing to be known as the person with the bible and that's how she was known to those who were uh, staff there i know she will be greatly missed during my Christmas holidays, I actually uh, spent a great deal of time in bed with a really nasty respiratory illness. And um, some of you remember me here on Christmas Day, and then after that I went straight home to bed with a fever and uh, was in bed for quite a bit of a week. But it wasn't time wasted. My son gave me a new book for Christmas. He got, he's studying right now at uh, Bible College, Heritage Bible College. In fact, he's going back this afternoon. And he bought me a book from one of, his, uh, one of the seminars he was in. It's called The Stone Crusher's Daughter, The Implications of Being Made in the Image of God by a man that some of you may recognize, Dr. David Lundy. David was actually here just last year, and I think he's been here before that. And as I read that book, I was reminded that there is gross injustice in our world. Unbelievable, when I read some of the things that were in that book. Now, this injustice is often perpetrated because of worldviews, not just worldviews, but uh, certain world religions that do not teach that human beings are created in the image of God. And we believe that. As we read the Bible, that Genesis says that every man and woman, no matter who you are, no matter where you are born, is created in God's image. That they are of tremendous value to God. And they should be to all of us who believe the Bible. So I read, I was reading through the book, and I read about some uh, very horrifying injustices that are still taking place in India, uh, in the Hindu caste system, among the Dalit people, some of you have heard these stories, they're relegated to perform tasks, even though it's illegal, uh, officially, they're relegated still, many of them, to do tasks that we wouldn't even give to animals. Horrible things I won't even repeat. We learn about injustice within some elements of the Islamic world, where in some areas, women are treated as second-class citizens. Actually, as I was thinking about that, uh, that reality, I was thinking about a recent story that just happened December 11th. Some of you heard this story. It happened December 11th in a church in Cairo, Egypt, uh, St. Peter and St. Paul's Orthodox Church, where a man went into the service and blew himself up and injured many, many women and children in the name of Islam. I also learned about injustice within postmodern society. This part of the book actually uh, resonated with me, with what's happening in our country and in North America. Postmodern society, which is uh, atheistic, uh, often secular humanistic, naturalistic, um, where people and institutions who are of faith are increasingly marginalized to act against their beliefs. And that hits really close to home, doesn't it? How many of you have read this article in our latest Nisbet Lodge um, newsletter by our CEO, Glenn Moorhouse? Some of you have read that. If you haven't, you need to read it. This is happening right next door in our own Nisbet Lodge that was actually built by Christians as a Christian home to preserve uh, the lives of people, to give them dignity and respect as they, as they age. We know that. That's why it was created. And so you need to read this article because uh, 
texts. Glenn Moorhouse is asking us to pray as we have a board meeting coming up at the end of this month because of the Ontario government's insistence that we provide in our home doctor-assisted suicide, uh, or, or doctor-assisted dying as it's euphemistically called. This is coming very close to home. People who do not treat human beings as created in God's image. And so pray for us. I'll be talking a little bit more about that next week. Should injustice bother us as Christians? Should it bother us? What does injustice in our city, in our country, and in our world have to do with me as a believer? Well, you know what? For God's people living in Jerusalem 700 years before Christ came to this earth, the answer to that question was often nothing. They were ambivalent to, or even worse, they were responsible for or or complicit in injustice among their own people. In fact, Scripture teaches us it was a time when many of the people in Jerusalem enjoyed great wealth, and yet the poor among them became even more poor, and they were oppressed, and they were discarded just like garbage. You see, all the laws that God had given them to care for the, the vulnerable and the oppressed the most vulnerable of society, were forgotten. And instead of providing for the poor and the vulnerable, those who were economically struggling, and some of them still were able to hang on to small tracts of land, they were being forced off of their land by wealthy homeowners and, and landowners who did not want poor people living in their neighborhoods. They wanted everyone around them to be wealthy like them. They could not tolerate them. And in their spare time, which seemed like all the time, they lived the high life. They were enjoying uh, their big feasts, their big banquets, their cocktails, their wines, and loud music, the Bible says, all the while, while gross injustice was happening in their own backyards. Oh, and one other thing I forgot to mention. Their fellow Jews, their neighbors to the north, the kingdom, the divided kingdom, which was uh, which was called Israel, they were called Judah. The kingdom that they had been divided from was being invaded by uh, pagan foreign countries. And instead of letting bygones be bygones, instead of rushing to help them when they called out for help, they joined forces with the enemy to fi finish them off. Now that is the spiritual state of Jerusalem, the city to which God called one of his most choice servants the prophet Isaiah, to come and speak to. And Isaiah's message was one of judgment, but not just judgment, one of future hope. But in the first of his 66 chapters, the call to God's people was a call to justice. Now, we as Christians who are no longer under the Old Testament law, as Isaiah was, may question whether justice is still a part of our mandate. Are we as Christians supposed to be active in the pursuit of justice in our world? And if so, what does that look like? Well, that's a great question. And over the next two Sunday mornings, we're going to be dealing with the topic of the call of God's justice to his people. This morning, we're going to focus on our responsibility from Scripture Next week, we're actually going to learn about some Christians who are making a difference in this world, just some exciting stories. And we're also going to deal with the topic, what happens when justice never seems to come? How do we respond to that? Well, before we took, take a look at Isaiah chapter 1, let's just bow our heads and just spend a moment asking for God's help. Can we do that together? Let's pray. Father, we come before your throne this morning in awe of who you are, as we've already been seeing this morning. You are perfectly holy and just. And as we look to your holy word this morning, would you teach us what it means to pursue justice as your children? We ask for your Holy Spirit's help this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now take your Bibles and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1. If you forgot to bring a Bible this morning, you can probably find one in front of you somewhere. In one of the racks in front of you, you'll find today's scripture reading, most of your Bibles, in page 483 if you're using one of the blue Bibles. And although we're going to be focusing in on verse 17, 
I want us to actually read verses 10 through 20 for the context. Listen in as I read the Word of God. Isaiah 1, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Here's the key passage, key verse. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They are, though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Now, what do we learn from this passage about our responsibility? Well, first of all, God calls us to be champions of justice for the oppressed. Look at verse 17 again. Do you see the command, seek justice? Now, the Hebrew word for seek often means to require or to demand. It's actually a very aggressive word. And did you know that all throughout the book of Isaiah, in fact, throughout the whole Old Testament, a call to justice is a command from God that's repeated over and over and over again. It is no small requirement for the people of God. Later on in the second part, portion of the book of Isaiah, in chapter 56, verse 1, we hear this. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Justice. Now, Isaiah wasn't alone during this time period. Three of Isaiah's contemporaries were people you might have heard of. Amos, Micah, Hosea, do those names ring a bell? Amos accused God's people of denying justice for the oppressed, trampling on the poor, forcing them to give them grain, depriving the poor of justice in the courts. You'll find that in Amos chapter 2 and, verse, and chapter 5. And then there was Hosea. Hosea accused God's people of multiplying lies and violence. Hosea chapter 12, verse 6, he urges them, but you must return to your God, maintain love and justice, and wait for your God always. And then Micah wrote on Micah, Micah chapter 6, verse 8, there was a lady in our church in Ottawa who had this on her license plate, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Those were three of Isaiah's contemporaries. But then there was Zechariah after the exile who wrote this. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, he says this. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the fatherless, the alien or the poor. In your hearts, do not think evil of each other. Some people say, well, hold on, Pastor Daniel. These were commands in the Old Testament. They were under the Old Covenant. Does the New Testament have anything to say about seeking justice, encouraging the oppressed, defending the cause of the fatherless, or pleading the case of the widow? Did the coming of Jesus Christ change our responsibilities? 
It's interesting. I did a study of the word justice in Scripture, and I found out that of 134 uses of the word, most were in the Old Testament. And about half of these references referred to God's justice, and half of them referred, or just over half of them referred to our responsibility for justice that he expects from us. Then in the New Testament, in the 16 times the word is used, not once is it used as a command for God's people. Usually it refers to the justice that God is going to bring. And so some people always look at that and they say, well, does that mean that matters of, of justice should not be important for those of the Christian faith, for Christians to engage in? And I would say, whoa, hold on here. Wait a second. What is true justice anyway? The answer comes at the end of the Old Testament, in the passage we just read. Look at that last passage we saw in Zechariah. Do you notice it says, administer true justice? And then Zechariah defines justice. What does he say? He says, show mercy and compassion to one another. Now, are mercy and compassion supposed to be a part of the Christian life? Yes, sir. If we use that definition of justice, justice demonstrated by mercy or compassion, do you know what we find? This is to be the hallmark of the Christian in the New Testament. We are told by Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. In the Gospels, seven times Jesus is referred as being filled with compassion. In the epistles, we as Christ's representatives, we are told to clothe ourselves with compassion, Colossians 3.12. And so as Christians, our call is to be champions of justice. It means that we are to look at the world with, with mercy and compassion. Now, in the Old Testament, the call to justice was mandated by law. For us, under the new covenant of grace, what does the Bible say? It says the law has been written where? On our hearts. We have experienced the justice of God, haven't we? We've experienced the justice of God by him placing the penalty of all, the, all of our sins on his son when he died on the cross, and we'll be celebrating that later on during the Lord's Supper. And the justice showed to us through Christ's mercy on us has transformed our lives. And so you see this, this compassion, this mercy that he has poured out into our lives by his Holy Spirit, it overflows from our lives into other people's lives around us. The Holy Spirit inside of us cries out when we see injustice, if we truly belong to God. In other words, God has called the New Testament believers to be champions of justice for the oppressed. Now, there's something else that's very exciting for the New Testament believer. For the follower of Jesus Christ, bringing God's justice to our fellow human beings has an amazing goal, and that's to point them to ultimate connection of mercy and justice, and that's to the cross of Christ. You see, set, setting captives free in the New Testament is not just about, as Michael prayed this morning, it's not just about releasing them physically, but ultimately, it's about seeing them released as captives spiritually, sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we're going to actually learn about this being set free Next month, we're going to be going through a series in Romans chapter 8. And in Luke 4, when Jesus preached his first sermon, listen to what he said. He read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and then he applied the passage to himself. He read this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to, re to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he added, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So bringing justice to the oppressed and the vulnerable, it's not just for the physical being, that's a big part of it. But if we just did that, if we just did that, we'd be failing in our calling. Listen to what Erwin Lutzer, pastor of Moody Bible Church, writes. He says, we can organize a moral crusade, we can raise a flag, we can work with anyone who is saluted, but let us not be so naive as to think that this is our great hope. Darkness can only be dispelled by light, 
and light comes from the gospel of God's grace. Let us never forget that the world's greatest need is always to see Jesus, to understand why he alone can reconcile us to God. And so the only way to truly set people free is to introduce them to Jesus Christ. We often say in mission work that we take a cup of cold water in one hand and the gospel in the other hand. Justice, by the way, by our mercy and compassion for the oppressed and vulnerable, it sometimes can be very dangerous work. We'll be praying for one of our brothers at the end of the service who is um, in a very dangerous spot right now. But for some, it can even come at a great cost to personal safety. It takes us out of our comfort zone. But what might that look like for you and for me? For some, for some of you already here are our table hosts and servers and organizers for our community dinner, our community dinner that reaches out to some of the most vulnerable people in our community. They come weekly here and get a nutritious, warm meal, and they get to hear the hope of Jesus. And so many of you have already helping out in that area. Perhaps for some people, maybe like Christian investigators or, or lawyers or police officers, it means to give their talents to justice. And some go above and beyond. I've been reading of some recently, and I'll be sharing a story next week, an amazing story of those who are using their talents to rescue those who are being used and abused, child slaves in the third world. Perhaps it would mean doing something really difficult, not turning a blind eye to elder abuse, showing the love of Christ to the elderly when their families have abandoned them. Perhaps it would be working with a pregnancy care center here in Toronto, coming alongside of women who feel that their only option left for them is to end the life of their child. And for them, or even for those who have already done that, it's pointing them to the grace and the forgiveness that can be found in Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we fail to listen to what God's Holy Spirit is telling us. And so what some people do is they run off in a hundred different directions, trying to solve the world's problems. Henry Blackaby, in his book, Experiencing Prayer with Jesus, speaks of an example of Peter, James, and John when, when they see Jesus transfigured. Remember, they, they want to build three tabernacles. And Blackaby writes, when you're praying either alone or with others and God is speaking to you, don't bring up your own agenda. Instead, shift your heart to receive his agenda. You know, I've often found that God uses us right where he's placed us, whether it's in the government whether it's the criminal justice system, whether it's in the service industry, whether it's in the corporate world, whether it's in the manufacturing ministry or industry, or even in, in our own Christian ministry. Each of those places, we are to seek justice and bring transformation to the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, he often focuses our attention to injustice in other parts of the world, and it's easy on our earth, as Pastor Isaac gave a great example this morning in his illustration, it's easy in our earth, which has become a global village with a population of seven, now 7.4 billion people, just to throw up our hands and say, I can't do anything. It's not worth it. Or worse yet, even ignore injustice. But that is not an option for us as believers. You see, and this is the second thing I want you to notice from Isaiah chapter 1. We miss a blessing from God when we ignore injustice. I want you to listen to Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 through 15 again. Listen carefully. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices... What are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me, new moon, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They become a burden to me. 
I'm weary of hearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Now, let me just explain a little bit what Isaiah is saying here. When he addresses the residents of Jerusalem as, as people of Sodom and Gomorrah, he's, he's not actually literally speaking to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's speaking to his own fellow citizens. But just like Jesus called Peter Satan, do you remember that? He's referring to his people as if they were symbolically representing those people, citizens of the most infamous sinful cities of the past. That would have really got their attention. And Isaiah points to three religious activities that people were still engaged in. And they, you know what? There were things that people God had given them to do. God had given them these feasts and these special celebrations. And yet, in this disobedience, in their disobedience to the things of, of righteousness and justice, these things were meaningless to God. They weren't doing these things out of an attitude of repentance. They were doing them out of an attitude of ritual. Ritual, not repentance. Now, before we're too hard on them, do we ever do that? Do we ever come to God and, we, and say, Lord, please forgive me, in ritual instead of repentance? Do we ever come to him glibly without intending to turn from our injustice towards others? And it's interesting, in verse 15, it spoke to the most intimate act of worship, which is prayer. And, and God says, that's detestable to me because you're ignoring justice. That's tragic. People were coming to God. They were lifting their hands in prayer to God. And Isaiah says they're full of blood, not literally filled with blood, but figuratively speaking, because they had, as a people, neglected justice as they had, they had over, overlooked protecting the vulnerable and the powerless being dragged off to death. Now, I just want to say one thing. This is, I want to say one thing the Bible's not saying. It's not saying that you and I must chase after every injustice known to humankind because you know what will happen? You will burn out. That would destroy you. But we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when he's showing us things. We have to listen. We have to pray. Say, Lord, what is it? What is it that you want me to respond to? He doesn't want us to ignore what some people call the holy discontent that he's placed in our hearts when we see injustice. And you know what? I'll promise you this. There is a blessing that comes from obedience. A blessing. You know, if God's brought a cause of justice to your heart and you're ignoring it, you won't experience his joy. Proverbs 21, 15 says, when justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous. And in John chapter 15, verse 10 and 11, Jesus said, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I read this little story a while back and it really caught my attention. It was a story of a man, a German man, who was really struggling and he came up to a pastor on the east coast of the United States after a morning service, and he shared with him this experience of going to church in Nazi Germany. And he said this. He said, I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. We heard stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it because what can anyone do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church, and each Sunday morning we could hear the whistle in the distance and then the wheels coming over the tracks. We became disturbed when we heard cries coming from the train as it passed by. We realized that it was carrying Jews like cattle in the cars. Week after week, the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that we would hear the cries of the Jews en route to a death camp. Their screams tormented us. We knew the time the train was coming, and when we heard a whistle blow, we began singing hymns. By the time the train came past the church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard the screams, we sang more loudly, and soon we heard them no more. Years have passed, and no one talks about it anymore, but I hear that train whistle in my sleep. God, forgive me. Forgive all of us who have called ourselves Christians, yet did nothing to intervene. Now, there were some that did intervene, some that gave their lives, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I trust this man telling the story 
did receive God's mercy because God is merciful towards us when we repent. That's why I'm so happy what God puts in the rest of that passage in Isaiah. Did you hear what he says in verse 18? The words foreshadowing what Jesus would do? Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And then he is foreshadowing what comes later on in the book in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah shares how that is possible, how that forgiveness is possible through Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, who was pierced for our transgressions, who was crushed for our iniquities, who received our punishment. And so we can come to God and we can say, I'm sorry, Lord, that I ignored your voice. Please forgive me and show me what to do. See, as Christians, God's called us to be different. We are called to be champions of justice for the oppressed. And if we obey that call to justice, we will gain God's blessing of joy and of peace. Now, finally this morning, I want to just share some good news, something that will encourage you, something that incredible happens as we seek justice. Are you ready? Here it is. We reflect the image of God when we seek justice. How do we know that? Well, the Bible says that Adam and Eve were created in God's image, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And that word image means reflection or exact representation. It was like that they were a mirror that were reflecting all the communicable attributes of God, like his creativity, his love, his compassion, his mercy, and his justice. But you know what happened, don't you? They disobeyed. And sin entered the world. And the fall of humanity affected the ability to reflect that image. They still, we still have the image of God inside of us. But here's the good news for us as Christians. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 says that God predestined us to be conformed to the likeness or the image of his son. Who is the only person to ever perfectly reflect God's image. And so when we seek justice, when we have mercy, and we have compassion towards others, we are being conformed to Christ's image. We're reflecting God's image to the world. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 17 says that Isaiah, seeking justice means encouraging the oppressed, defending the cause of the fatherless, pleading the case of the widow. Are you listening to that? What does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like the actions of God himself? Listen into Psalm chapter 10, verse 16 and 18. It says this, The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from this, hand, this, this land. You hear, O Lord, the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them. You listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed in order that man who is of the earth may terrify no more. When we do acts of justice, compassion and mercy, we're actually doing the very works of God. We are reflecting the image of God. We are being conformed to the image of Christ. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 5, it makes a very bold statement. It says, evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it fully. The Bible teaches us that, that the only ones who really understand justice are the ones who truly seek after God. So what have we learned this morning? Christians above all others need to be champions of justice for the oppressed. It's an act of obedience. In fact, if we ignore justice, we're missing a blessing from God. We're missing his joy. It's also important for us to pray and ask where the Holy Spirit will lead us. And when we do obey his voice and uphold justice, we will overflow with mercy and compassion towards others. He and we... And listen to this. He has shown us that something incredible will happen. We will reflect the image of God to the world. A world that needs Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, that ends part one. Next week's going to be very encouraging to you. We're going to be hearing some stories of people who are making a difference, Christians who are making a difference all over the world in the area of injustice. And we're also going to wrestle with that question, what happens to when all the injustice is never resolved, when it never seems to be resolved, what's going to happen? So I encourage you to be here again.
Let's pray together as we enter into our time of communion. Father, as we come to the Lord's table in communion this morning, <clears throat> we pray that we will become more like Jesus Christ, conformed to his image, the one through his sacrifice truly sets captives free. And may we lay aside our personal comfort and follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit in us as he moves us to pray and act. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.